Hello, I'm Isabella, and my project is about trimeric endolysins, which are a type of antimicrobial enzyme that can be used as a last resort to combat antibiotic resistance. To give a little background, um, antibiotic resistance happens when bacteria who survive all doses of an antibiotic pass their genes onto the next generation. So then you have this new group of bacteria who are tolerant to that drug. And it's not good because resistance is developing a lot faster than we are to discovering new antibiotics. For example, we're finding a new antibiotic almost once every like 10 to 15 years, but resistance is developing nearly every day, especially to the very powerful drugs that we usually save for the worst scenarios. And to combat this, people use bacteriophages, which are tiny viruses that hunt and kill bacteria. They were used during World War I as an early antimicrobial, but was soon rejected because there was penicillin discovered by Fleming. And phages, they kill using the lytic cycle. And at the lytic at end of the lytic cycle, they release enzymes called endolysins, which just dis dissolve the peptidoglycan in the host bacteria's cell wall. Over here is an image of a bacteriophage. They have very funny structures. And over here, this is the lytic cycle that they use. And you can see at the end, the host cells, it breaks apart. And then the phages that have been assembled, they get to break out using their enzymes. And here's how the enzyme works. It's called an endolysin, and it usually targets either the purple chains, which are a carbohydrate, or the red chains, which are an amino acid peptide. Now, here's what we've done so far to combat the effects of antibiotic resistance. First, we started using phage therapy in the early 1900s, but it didn't work very well because the phages were too specific. Then we moved on to the penicillin, which replaced phages because they were more effective and cheaper to make. Then we had the first report of methicillin-resistant S. aureus, which was really bad because that was their strongest antibiotic at the time, and nobody had any way to combat it, so then research was really frantic to find an alternative. In the 2000s, we had one of our first reports of successful phage therapy, and uh, people grew more on that and discovered that you can use their enzymes as an external method of killing bacteria. But here's the thing, most of these methods didn't work well because of several reasons. The first round of phage therapy was unreliable because there was lack of knowledge about the subject. And antibiotics, of course, they had resistance and we spent a lot of money trying to develop increasingly powerful ones to deal with the new superbugs. When we re, uh, rediscovered phage therapy, uh, we realized that bacteria, they grow resistant to phages 10 times faster than they do to antibiotics. And endolysins, oh. they're not as good either because they're really tedious to make, and they also only target about one to two species of bacteria each. So it's not effective for us to use as a therapeutical drug just by itself. Now, our approach takes these endolysins and makes them into a more viable solution. For example, we take the most effective lysins, LISAP26, LISK, PLYPI, and CPL1 for the top three medically relevant gram-positive bacteria, which are S. aureus, S. pyogenes, or group A strep, and S. pneumoniae. And then we connected them like you can see in picture two. These chimeras, they were connected using a linker, either a helical linker over here or a uh, proline-rich linker over here. These new enzymes, they're special because they are capable of lysing multiple genera of bacteria. So they're acting as a less specific approach to the normally hyper-specific form of endolysin therapy. When making multiple lysin cocktails to ca tackle complex and often drug-resistant infections, researchers often have to go through a lengthy process to make two of the original lysins from the phages, and then they have to put them in a bacteria for them to express, and then they have to extract it. So they have to do this two to five times in order to actually take out the entire infection because infections are often more than one species of bacteria. But these new lysins that we came up with, they're able to target multiple genera of bacteria. So they can target the entire staph genus and the entire strep genus. So we can use them as a twice as good endolysin. And they also won't be susceptible to an antibiotic because peptidoglycan doesn't mutate very often. Here's the, the way that we created this thing. First, we found the most effective lysins for the three most clinically significant bacteria worldwide from GenBank, which is NCBI data, database. And then we realized from a research paper that the most effective biological expression linkers were very rigid. So either they were made of an alpha helix, as shown in the previous slide, um, those don't bend very easily and they act like a stiff rod to keep the two proteins away when interacting, or they were made from a proline-rich motif. And since proline, uh, as you may know, has a side chain, 
that connects to the R group. So it's a very rigid amino acid and is able to create really stiff coils. These listens were then paired with each of the linkers to make 10 total different chimeras. After that, we did homology modeling. In order to test for the peptidoglycan affinity in the chimeras later on, we had to find out that um, we had to find the 3D models of each of the chimeras, and we did that using Swiss model and ITASR, which were both homology modeling softwares, or DEMO, which connects the two uh, listens together to the linker, and we use PyMol to visualize the 3D models to check for errors. And then in order to actually test the effectiveness of this new drug, we used um, SwissStock, which is an enzyme prediction software, and we took the four substrates of the four listens which were fragments of peptidoglycan and inputted them into Swiss stock along with the completed chimeras to test for affinity in each of them. The results of, uh, wait, okay. And this is an example of homology modeling with demo. So you can see over here on the purple and you can see over here, this is the green helix that connects both of the two endolysins together. So when this thing is uh, injected into a patient to treat for bacteria, infections, you can use only one at a time. So then that way they won't interfere with each other because there's a linker that's separating them. So you can use this as basically a dual purpose drug. And then over here, you can see this is the proline coil and it's similar to the alpha helix in that they're both rigid. And here are the results. So the analysis values that we used for this project were delta G and binding energy. If we have a lower delta G, that means it's more energetically favorable for the substrate peptidoglycan to bind with the active site of the listen. But if we have a lower binding energy, that means it's a more spontaneous reaction, which means that there's less effort needed for the protein complex to form. Over here is an example of the docking that you can see a Swiss model. The blue is CPL1, which is a staphylo, uh, an S pneumoniae endolysin. And then over here, this uh, darker blue is a uh, PlyPi, which is a group A strep listen. And over here are the two active sites for CPL1. When we docked using um, Swiss stock, we could test the affinity of the enzyme for these two pockets over here with choline, which is an integral molecule in the uh, numinococcal cell wall. And we used Swiss stock and we could get the delta G and binding energy values for those two locations. And then comparing that with the other completed chimeras, we could determine which one was the most effective and possibly the best to be used in real life scenarios. And here are the results of the docking analysis. And as you can see from the results of the table, um, list case CPL1 proline was the most negative uh, changes in total affinity which also means that it had the greatest decrease in delta G and binding energy combined, which means that it's the most likely to perform well in a biological expression. And since the number is negative, that means it actually performs better than the original enzymes. So this is actually an upgrade from the original phage therapy and endolysin therapy. Uh, you can see, however, that LISAP PlyPi, the helix version, didn't perform nearly as well, and it had a two plus increase in the delta G binding affinity, which means that it performs worse than the regular listens. So here's a reason as to why it might not work, uh, as, as to why uh, LISK CPL1 proline performs so well in the docking analysis. As you can see on the left in the cyan, there is an addition of two new threonines. Uh, these two new threonines were able to interact with the active site of LISK because they came from CPL1. And CPL1, it folded really closely to LISK when um, being combined by DEMO. And because of that, it was able to change the active site of LISK, which is a S. aureus endolysin. And with the addition of the two new threonines, we could have an addition of some new hydrophobic or hydrogen bonds that were being formed. And these hydrophobic interactions were taken into account by Swiss stock, and then it resulted in a, a higher affinity for the peptidoglycan. The peptidoglycan is the yellow molecule, and then the pink is the active site of LISK enzyme. And here's the conclusion of our study. To summarize this study, it focuses on the design and testing of 10 chimeric endolysins made from the listens of the three most medically relevant species of gram-positive bacteria, including S. aureus, group A strep, and S. pneumoniae. 
By testing the completed chimeras for binding affinity to peptide glycan using Swiss stock, it was determined that LISK CPL1 proline had the most negative changes to total affinity, so it was the most energetically favorable of 10 and thus the most likely to be viable during physical experimentation. Additionally, since LISK is a staph listen and at CPL1 is a pneumococcal listen, this chimera, along with the rest of the 10 previously mentioned in the diagram, they're able to kill bacteria in multiple genuses, so they're functioning as a single enzyme with the capabilities of two. So it reduces the workload of drug synthesis in uh, bacteriophage therapy by half because you can only you only need to make one enzyme that can kill twice as much bacteria. And of course, since peptidoglycan doesn't mutate very often between species of bacteria, this drug was actually going to be resistance free. And you can use this as a last resort in case a uh, bacterial infection is immune to antibiotics. And lastly, I want to end by thanking Teleria. Thank you for providing me this opportunity to work with a mentor who is knowledgeable about bioinformatics, which is a field that I never even considered before joining Teleria. And uh, my mentor was Piyush Agarwal from Simon Fraser University in British Columbia. And he knew a lot about bioinformatics and had quite a few papers published on the subject. And because he knew so much, he was able to teach me how to use many programs that I didn't know before. And now I was able to use those programs to gain statistics about these enzymes that may have not been testable without a lab previously.